great. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'll do proper introductions in a second. I know we've started recording already, but just to do a little bit of housekeeping um, before we kind of get sort of started and, and into the content. Um, so we are recording this session and, and this is, uh, we've been doing this with all of the sessions. For those of you that have joined us before, a couple of names people see um, have joined us from some of the other sessions. Um, we're recording all of these um, in these sort of bite-sized sessions. There's four in total um, that we've done um, and they are being um, added to um, our kind of um, of our LinkedIn page that Simon has set up for this network. Um, so you will be able to access those and also the slides will be shared as part of that. And I know following this kind of whole sort of series of these four kind of sessions that we've done, um, Simon will kind of send out the links to all of those with the slides as well um, so that you've got access. So if you haven't seen the other ones prior to that, um, then don't worry, you can kind of watch again. Um, and um, I'll do a bit of a, a kind of a brief kind of context setting at the beginning of this, just for those who, who kind of haven't been on the other sessions and perhaps aren't aware of the work that um, Grant Thornton have done with, with um, Bradford Council going forward. So I will cover that, don't worry. Um, what would be great is if you could um, use the chat throughout this session, but if you could introduce yourself in the chat just to say, um, so, you know, what your name is and the organisation you are, and then it's a good way just to kind of connect um, through this session. Um, and also, as we go through, please do post any questions in the chat as well, but there will be opportunity for us to kind of have a bit of a debate and uh, participate in kind of conversation as we go through, because I like, I like to kind of do that rather than me be on transmit the whole way through um, the presentation. So please do, um, as we go through, any kind of um, sort of chat sections and, and discussions, please do get involved and, and share your thoughts um, and, and opinions as well. That would be great. OK, so um, so to introduce myself, so I'm Katie Nightingale. I'm an associate director with Grant Thornton. And as I mentioned, we've been working with um, Bradford Council now for um, probably over three years now, following the ori original project that we did to sort of support um, the council and another employer looking at their inclusion maturity. So them understanding kind of where they are on their inclusion journey and support them to think about areas of focus that might support that, um, you know, increasing uh, that feeling of inclusion and general kind of practices around being much more inclusive, which will drive diversity. Um, so we've been working with the council now, as I say, for, for a number of years, and we've, we're supporting particularly this part of the of the work, which is around um, enhancing the inclusive employers um, network. And, and this series of um, sessions that we've done, as I say, um, over the last sort of few months, um, is just kind of doing a deeper dive into some of our um, factors which sit within our inclusion maturity model to hopefully help you as employers to think about where there are areas that you could start to think about to improve um, the sort of inclusive practices that you have. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're going to be doing um, today. So um, as I say, I'm going to set some context around kind of this for those of you who perhaps haven't seen it again. So for those of you who've seen this a few times before, um, you might you might switch off. I won't I won't labour on it too much because um, as I say, um, we've got plenty of kind of opportunities to, to access some of that information, particularly our toolkit that we did with the council some time ago. So we can add that link in any kind of post communications for you to have a look at, which talks a little bit more about our, our model and approach um, as well. Um, but we'll just do a quick reminder of those five inclusive factors that we've covered over the last sort of series. Um, and then we're going to do that deeper dive into the external impact, which is an area which is um, an interesting one because organisations often tend to focus in on what's going on inside the organisation, which is right to do. Get that right before you potentially look externally. Um, but there's some areas where you can really start to kind of bring that um, much more in a rounded way, um, start to reach out into the community and the people that you work with which is very much looking at how you can be much more inclusive um, externally outside of your organisation. Um, so we're going to be covering that today. Um, and I will do a little bit like I've done in the other sessions, a little bit of, you know, giving you some information, talking through the details and elements of those factors. And then there's opportunities for you to get involved in terms of some poll questions that we've got and then some questions and answers and some debate, hopefully through this sort of hour as well. Um, and then any sort of final questions you might have. So um, in terms of that kind of context setting um, that we've got, um, so really we have um, a model that we use called the inclusion maturity model. It's something that Grant Thornton um, created, and this was a way of kind of helping organisations understand where they were on their inclusion journey. And this goes from everything from literally kind of emerging where you are starting to really just maybe be just compliant or really just start to think about some of the basic elements of inclusion and diversity 
all the way through to where it becomes systemic um, and it just becomes part of your normal practice every day where everyone feels included. You're seeing diversity, you know, throughout the organisation. It's valued. It's just literally part of your DNA. And there's a whole heap of kind of, you know, um, variations throughout that kind of journey. Um, and we see a lot of organisations sitting in characteristic focus where there's a lot of emphasis supporting, um, you know, that element of where there might be underrepresented groups to kind of help increase that diversity and support and that feeling of inclusion with those groups. So we see a lot of organisations in that space moving into inclusion where really seeing that kind of true practices becoming much more inclusive. So it's helping organisations understand where you are, find that baseline, really focus in on particular areas where you need to focus your energy, your time, your money, which will add the best and greatest sort of value in terms of creating that inclusion. Um, and as I sort of mentioned, um, as I was talking probably a bit earlier, you may not have caught it, but we use a three sort of factor approach in terms of gathering that data from looking at the demographics of your organisation, so the diversity data, we capture that from your workforce. We get the sentiment of the workforce by kind of asking people how included they feel across a number of different questions based on our five factors, which I'll talk about. Um, and then we also look at your practices as well, your policies, your processes and how inclusive they might be. And looking at those three different um, elements, that helps us give a real good understanding of how inclusive your organisation is. And again, where perhaps that focus needs to be to help um, improve inclusive inclusion and then increasing diversity as a result of that. Um, so we've got these five factors because what we wanted to do is really kind of hone in on specific areas where um, organisations would start to see inclusion. So that is talent attraction, talent development, strategic development, inclusive culture and external impact. Um, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail now so that you can you can see what we mean by those. Um, so here's the five and, and, um, and we've been through a few of these already, but talent attraction, this is how does your organisation attract and recruit diverse talent? So it's very much looking at that beginning stage, everything from when you're out in the marketplace and attracting all the way through to when you get to the point where you onboard talent and what that looks like. Then we move to talent development, and this is how you develop, progress and retain talent um, all the way through to, you know, from giving people the right training, access to new opportunities through to succession planning and actually progressing people that way. Strategic development is very much around kind of actually your strategic kind of in, um, intentions around that strategy and what that looks like and how the organisation goes about doing that, how open um, about that, how well they communicate that as well. Then we have the inclusive culture. This is very much around the environment and the way that it's set up. So how developed is the culture to enable that feeling of inclusion? And this can be from you know, anything, um, the way that you're set up, from the offices that you have, the, the way that you communicate, all those types of things. And then the last one, which we're going to be covering today, is around the external piece. So how do you, does your organisation actually impact external stakeholders? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those external stakeholders are, but it's very much looking outward of the organisation and thinking about how that impact on community and, again, those sort of external partnerships that you have. So um, we've got some green ticks against um, four of those factors. So we have um, got those. So as I say, you can access those videos um, and those slides um, following this session if you'd like to kind of go and have a watch of those. Um, but we've got this last session on external impact to focus in on today. And I think hopefully it will create some good debate because it's perhaps, like I say, an area that isn't necessarily something that is focused in on as much. Um, but I'd be really interested to see um, if many of you have got much more kind of um, elements of kind of thinking externally about inclusion and diversity as we go through this. So please let us know. And thank you so much for, for putting in your, um, your details. Great to see you today. Thanks for joining us. OK, so it, deeper dive into external impact then. Um, so again, so this is how does the organisation impact its external stakeholders around inclusion? Um, and what we mean by external stakeholders, that's everything from clients, customers, people that may interact in the community um, with your organisation. It could be partners. It could be, you know, charitable or like organisations as part of that. It could be suppliers as well. So we kind of factor all of that in, in terms of that external impact. And, and that's when we start to think about you know what are the different elements of that um, and that we look at in three different areas so advocacy um, and that is very much around and we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into kind of what looks like 
going from sort of emergent practice to sort of more best practice that we see. But advocacy is just generally around how you as an organisation go out to the marketplace to advocate inclusion, how vocal you might be around particular topics or how little vocal you are, perhaps how much more reserved you might be to talk in the, in the marketplace about how inclusive you are, your culture, etc. Then social responsibility. I think most of you have probably heard about social responsibility. Again, it's like this corporate element of, you know, ensuring how are we making sure that we are, you know, treating people fairly. We've got that kind of responsibility piece um, that comes through. So if we've heard of ESG, so environment, social and governance is, is got um, a lot of kind of traction over sort of the last year or two. Um, so it's becoming more and more important, whether it's from regulators or anything else that's looking at this kind of social responsibility from an ESG perspective. Um, and so actually inclusion sits firmly in the social element of ESG um, and there's a lot more kind of focus, like I say, for organisations to prove that they are being much more um, inclusive, um, certainly from the financial sector. So the FCA is um, clearly putting out quite clear um, sort of expectations of employers in the financial sector around what they see at board level from a diversity perspective. And I think we will start to see more um, sort of regulators and, and various other organisations following suit in that way as well. So it's something to certainly think about as organisations in terms of how we go about presenting that externally in the marketplace. And then the last one of this is being customer focused. Again, it's very um, important that we make sure that our workforce um, you know, feels included, but likewise, our customers and our clients want to feel that sense of um, inclusion when they're when they're you know interacting with you as an organization. Um, and also that you know the organization is reflective of the customer base or the community within which you serve. And so that's where that interaction comes, particularly around customers um, within within that as well. So um, we should have a bit of a poll coming up now, hopefully, Simon, um, with the magic of um, teams. Um, so we've got a question which we'd like to ask, which is around, is your organisation actively involved in inclusion and diversity initiatives in your community? Um, now, this is one of them, but I'd be interested to hear any other sort of activities you might be kind of um, involved in. So um, if it's a yes, feel free to kind of share any sort of other activities that you're doing as well. So we've got three so far. I've tried to make it so we can all see how many yes, we can. we've had. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So we've got five people at 100%. Okay, so I think that's probably everyone actually on the call, is it? So everyone has said yes. So that's fantastic. Would anyone feel comfortable to kind of just share some of the things that you're doing in this space? Because um, I think it'd be interesting just to hear what you're getting involved with. Not to put anyone on the spot, but I think the university is doing quite a bit. I don't know if, if you want to share any of that, Irfan. Um, yeah, yeah. Um... Hi, Alvin Fakir, University of Bradford. Um, I'll be working with the Inclusive Employer Network from, I think, inception. So, um, Simon, you know what we do, but for anybody who doesn't, um, where <clears throat> I work in the Employer and Placement Services team, um, what we're trying to do is um, help employers um, become more inclusive um, by targeting them individually. So some of the employers who are in the Inclusive Employer Network, they will have already had conversations with myself or my colleagues about becoming more inclusive. But we're also commissioning. So for instance, um, other initiatives, I think Tiffany is here today as well. Um, she was here earlier on. I uh, can't say her name, but um, to support um, BAME, um, graduates to uh, do PhDs so um, that's an, another initiative that we've got going at the moment and also I'm also a member of the ch of the um, I'm actually the chair of the race equality staff forum and that's about um, promoting inclusivity across the university so we, we get um, uh, um, equality and um, inclusion assessments that come through us so we look at all the different policies that are being placed, um, being put in place in the university, and we look at them and how those policies would affect stakeholders. 
across the university and uh, and outward um, externally as well, so public uh, stakeholders as well. Um, alternatively, um, outside of, say, for instance, the university, um, I work, I'm a scout leader, so I work with scouts. Um, I'm also working with their, with the district committee to make scouts more diverse. So, um, yeah, so um, quite a lot going on. Don't want to take Brilliant. up too much time, but I could bang on forever. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think the example of the of like the scouts, for example, is that, you know, there's a lot of things that go on in the community. We think about it from an employer's perspective sometimes, but actually getting involved or encouraging our, you know, our staff network to to get involved, you know, and, and thinking that from an inclusive lens, you know, as part of the different community activities they get involved with is is, re is really good. And I'm not sure actually whether we see um, so many employers thinking along those lines. And I think that's that's really that's really good. And I saw Julia, you put uh, Julia, you've put there sort of you commission services um, within um, which you work with. So you work with providers to ensure that they're supporting people from across all communities. And does that have a bit of an inclusion lens on it as well? I mean, it's just again, just kind of supporting and just kind of making sure that you're pulling the community together in terms of those services. Um, I mean, that depends on which service it is, really. So it's adult social care. So mm -hmm. we're not approaching it from a cohesion point of view, mm -hmm. primarily. But um, yes, yeah, certainly within um, some of the projects, it, it would incorporate that. But it's much more, I guess, around making sure that those services are offering people support, irrespective of which community they feel they belong to. So whether that's mm -hmm communities around a community of interest whether it's around you know somebody's sexuality or whether it's about ethnicity or whatever that uh, any of the protected characteristics mm -hmm. so just making sure it's accessible to everyone no matter what their background or their you know access to whatever it might be in that way and I guess from a from a kind of a um, you know a, 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 a that kind of service it, that should be almost part and parcel and run through from it's almost it's just systemic in terms of the work that you're yeah. doing to make sure that everyone yeah. has access to it so yeah brilliant thank you um would anyone else and like share anything else that you've been doing sort of in the community um specifically pop it in the chat if you do talk. hero hi um, i'm a student of Bravo. Um, my project, my dissertation covers um, inclusion, it's all about inclusion. So, um, I'm still working on it. Uh, my focus majorly is on talent attraction to the community mm -hmm. and within the community. So, I'm still working on it. And um, I'm getting to a stage where I have need a, a, a focus group because uh, I'm using the primary um, data where how we need a focus group on discussion where we have to discuss about how we how we carry on inclusion within the community mm -hmm. so i'm still working on here and i'm getting to a stage whereby i'll have i will need us to discuss about it so i'll be able to go further into it and bring in more details oh that sounds great and that's going to be really interesting the output from that so is that something that you're working on over the next sort of few months yeah um because of other school activities, uh, there's still a little bit distraction, but I'm still looking for how to bring everything together. So I'm thinking, hopefully, maybe next month or towards the ending of this month. Fabulous. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, it'll be interesting to hear um, more about that as that develops, I think. And I guess, Simon, are you kind of connected in with what Hero is doing? I am, yes, Katie. So uh, one of the things that I hear of probably needs at this point in time from the network, and I will send an email out once I've had a chat with Hero this afternoon, is commitment to maybe get involved in some interviews um, just to talk a little bit about the talent attraction and issues they've faced, any kind of good, good, uh, positive experiences they may have had, what they've learned from um, the Inclusive Employers Toolkit and some of these um, workshops they've had. So Hero's dissertation specifically focuses on an inclusion factor from the toolkit. 
Um, hence why he's chosen uh, talent attraction specifically, because he mm. thought that's probably an area that Bradford, and he wants to focus on Bradford. So there isn't one employee he'll be interviewing. His, his intention is to maybe interview a range of people in Bradford and kind of make it place-based rather than focusing on one specific employer. And just to recognise really, um, kind of showcase the maybe any good practice we have, but also um, put in some kind of recommendations to overcome challenges that we're facing in the district. That would be fantastic. I think that would be really interesting, you know, to get that kind of broad range of kind of practice that's out there. And, and again, those um, kind of practical tips and things like that. So, oh, I look forward to uh, to seeing the output from that. That's great. Thanks, Hero. Perfect. OK, well, Thank we'll... You. sorry, Hero. Brilliant. OK, so we'll move on to um, thinking about some of the D3 elements um, uh, from each from from external impact um, and this the way that we set this up um, obviously again some of you have seen how we've done this before um, is just to kind of show what might be kind of more kind of emerging or we've kind of classed it as poor practice it's just very basic practice and what we want to do is kind of obviously showcase and get people kind of an organizations thinking about what what good or great practice looks like around this. Um, so with advocacy, you know, if we're looking at what, what looks either is not great practice um, or very basic would be um, that, you know, organisation from an ad advocacy perspective, they're just very passively complying with legislation. So they're doing the bare minimum to make sure that, you know, there's no kind of like, um, you know, legal kind of um, ramifications to something that they're doing, which is inappropriate or, you know, illegal in that sense, which feels very, very basic. Um, and organisations may be uncomfortable about speaking out on particular issues through fear of getting it wrong or alienating stakeholders. Now, this is something that's um, it, it's a tricky one, I think, and quite emotive. So when there are certain subjects that people might want to talk about, it can be very, very tricky for organisations, particularly thinking from a reputational perspective about how to engage uh, in a particular topic, for example. So if we consider the Black Lives Matter movement, there was um, a lot of um, kind of, I guess, a lot of kickback on organisations that didn't respond quickly enough or those that didn't respond at all. And I think it was very tricky for organisations to kind of navigate that. But this is where you need to start thinking about your internal connection um, around how you communicate internally with messages that might be um, quite sensitive, quite emotive, and how you would go about doing that from, you know, internally, um, you know, communicating something to then externally doing that. And the organisations that have got that mechanism in place and are very strong around what their views on things are and how they will speak about things, um, generally will be um, in a much better position when something like the Black Lives Matter movement happened and the death of George Floyd happened, how they would then respond to that. Um, and actually, you know, again, the reputational um, either, you know, I hate to say this, advantage or, you know, actually damage that that can create is something that organisations do need to think about, um, not only kind of internally in reputation, but also externally as well. So what we see in terms of good practice, like I say, is, is you have a really good mechanism for responding to things in a really quick and an agile way um, and making sure that you do that sensitively and you have those checks and balances in place. And I've talked on previous sessions around what that might look like to have a diverse group of people to sense check messages with, um, to make sure that, you know, you've got the right tone of voice when you go out and you communicate anything. Um, so you'll start to see that in organisations that are are, you know much more kind of leading in this space um and they will they will kind of lead in terms of messaging that goes out in terms of their practices they won't always wait for something to happen you know like a, a big news story they will actually openly talk very often around what inclusive means to them their point of view on on different matters around inclusion and diversity they will maybe publish what their kind of their thinking is through thought leadership or they will kind of you know post that quite openly on their website to be really really clear um, from a, a kind of a, an employer brand perspective as well sharing stories or thoughts around that um, and they will actively speak out but they will have those mechanisms to make sure that they're doing it in the right way as I mentioned um, so there's I think from an advocacy point of view similarly to anything is that where there is that kind of um, as an organization it's it's kind of making sure that you have a voice that is the voice that you want to make sure that the external um, you know market 
can understand from your culture, your point of view, but also very, very sensitive to what's going on as well. Um, so, and I know as sort of smaller organisations, that can be very, very daunting. It's much easier for large organisations that maybe have communications teams as well. Um, but again, if you are a smaller organisation, then something to kind of consider is, you know, checking in with whether you have any kind of like um, peer colleagues, you know, from other organisations that you might be able to talk and maybe share with, whether it is even kind of contacting, um, you know, the council, for example, and understanding what kind of going on in the community and if there are any kind of um, thinking around um, some of the particular topics that are coming out and how you might be able to advocate as part of a wider group ne not necessarily as a lone voice perhaps um, so there's lots of different ways I think you can probably um, do that from an advocacy point of view and again if you're just starting on this journey is is sense checking what those messages might be what's what's important to your to your workforce what might be important to your customers for example as well and really starting to think about what that looks like in terms of how you might go forward as an organization in the in the external um, community to kind of be an advocate for whether it's certain groups or just generally around inclusion and diversity as well. So that's kind of advocacy and again if you've got any questions that we go through please let, let me know but we've got some some time at the end to kind of talk through any of these particular elements um, of interest as well um, if helpful. So if we go on to um, social responsibility, so I think hopefully this probably feels fairly familiar um, to, to kind of most of you, I sort of mentioned this before, um, but in terms of kind of poor practice or, or kind of very basic practice um, is that actually an organisation at worst just doesn't even think about the social impact of what they're doing. I mean, that can be um, anything if you think more broadly about social impact in terms of, um, you know, even the environment element of um, the, the impact of, you know, waste that's used or the suppliers that you use, um, how ethical you're sourcing things as well, because that can have an impact on the environment in that, uh, the, the, the kind of from a social perspective as well. Um, but also thinking about, you know, if you think about the customers, you know, the way that you um, set your organisation up, you know, the way that you, if you have any kind of particular um, sort of retail stores or, or any kind of like um, front facing kind of customer environment how accessible is that for someone who may be you know um, have a, a, a physical um, a disability or an impairment in that way what does that look like or you know who have you got helping customers you know is it is it kind of a diverse you know um, group of people that are doing that how how kind of reflective is that of the community that is going to be coming in how comfortable people might feel so there's all of these kind of visual kind of cues around that particularly from that kind of social impact perspective but also just supporting the community with different activities whether it's kind of charitable um, or engaging um, with your workforce in the community as well um, so you start to see that you know from many organisations, they will do very limited amounts of that. Um, and actually, that does have a reputational impact, um, which sometimes um, organisations don't necessarily think about, but absolutely should be, because that's where we would see leading practice in this space. Um, so, I mean, some of the, the kind of the really good practice is that there will be a clear social purpose um, and it does consider the activities um, that they do and they also encourage um, you know the workforce their people to get involved in that as well um, and they regularly review that in terms of what the impact is whether that is kind of gauging feedback from um, you know people in the organization or externally as well so really making sure that they're continuously trying to improve um, from a social responsibility perspective um, and also, you know, they've got that clear environmental policy. So I've talked about, you know, the ESG, which is kind of very topical at the moment. So that environmental, social and government and most organisations that start to lead in this have an ESG policy and they've got real kind of clarity in terms of what their point of view is on those things. They've got policies which backs that up. They've made sure that the workforce is very aware of what that means, how they can play their part in that and have that their own sort of individual responsibility. So that's where we start to see kind of really leading practice when it comes to social responsibility as well as things as like publishing reports. So you may see corporate social responsibility reports that some large organisations may have, um, but also things like just being very clear and open about inclusion and diversity, their strategy on that and what their point of view is um, around that and what kind of governance they've got that supports all of that from a point of view of, you know, if they're regulated, being able to kind of show and demonstrate what they're doing in that space from a clear action plan to kind of showing the outputs as well. Um, so we do 
see that often. And again, if you're a smaller organization, um, having the um, thinking about how you might be able to do that, if you have a web presence, how you might be able to share what your commitment to, um, you know, um, any kind of social um, responsibility might be. And it might not need to be something overly Big, but it's just something where there's some key activities that you might be doing to demonstrate that element of kind of environment and social and governance around this sort of piece of work. But again, try and find organisations that you may be paired with that can support you in terms of thinking through what that might look like if you are a slightly smaller organisation um, and have less resources to be able to have, you know, do all these big reports and have corporate social responsibility teams and things like we do have a Grant Thornton, for example, or in, or in the council. Um, so definitely reach out um, and, and kind of connect to see how you might be able to do that on, on a slightly smaller scale for, for the what's relevant to the context of your business. So that's sort of social responsibility. And then the last one around um, customer focus. Um, so this one, again, often we tend to find that, you know, it might be the sales team that might be very much focused on on kind of the customer and looking at the demographics and what, you know, the customer wants and making sure that it's responsive in that way. Um, but there is a real difference in terms of kind of that um, social element and that inclusion element when it comes to um, focusing on the customer. And I think this is where it's about kind of having that dual look from a point of view of being able to service customer needs, um, but thinking much more holistically around what customers are looking for. So why would they engage with you as um, as an uh, you know as as an organisation to um, provide them a service or a product in that way? Um, and, and how might um, you know your external image actually kind of feel to people who are going to be engaging with you, particularly those that you might want to be looking at as new customers coming through as well. So poor practice is things like, you know, no strategy in place for thinking about customer targeting and pitching. Um, it may be that you've just not really thought about any kind of, you know, how inclusion might impact, you know, whether it's how accessible you are, um, you know, whether it's on your website or kind of front facing stores, physical stores, et cetera. There's no tailored services thinking about perhaps some of those um, protected characteristics. Again, you might just be doing it from a legal perspective, but not thinking much more broadly about how that experience that customer might have with you, what that might feel like. Um, and there's little understanding about actually what is the makeup of your customer base? So what does that demographics look like? You know, is it kind of very representative of the community that you're in or is it very different? So what does that look like and how do you make sure that you can kind of um, think about what inclusion means to, to the, your, your customer base? Um, so the good practice is pretty much the obviously the, the converse of that in terms of really having that strategy in place, understanding the customer experience, really kind of looking at that along the whole journey and, and actually understanding how that feels and might feel, whether that's getting, you know, um, customers together and asking their opinion and and um, maybe it's focus groups and just thinking about that and really starting to think about how uh, different groups within your customer base what that might look like for them in terms of that experience and how you might make that much more accessible for them. Um, and also things like training your staff to think about how to engage with with different groups, you know, within the customer base as well. Um, so there's a there's a lot that can be done around this from a customer perspective, because, again, we need to think about the as employers. Um, many of our customers, you know, or clients may well be our staff of the future. So, again, it's about you know thinking about the impact of your own reputation um, of on, on the kind of the community and the, and the customers, clients that you might be you might be kind of talking to. Um, so so that's kind of customer focus and ho hopefully that's kind of giving you a bit of a feel to what we're talking about in terms of all of those those, those three elements as part of this particular um, uh, this this sort of factor that we look at and and kind of why it's important um, and not something that we you know we that we just look internally is important that we do look at these external factors as well. Um, so on that note, and that's me kind of doing my transmit, um, so it's a, a bit shorter than some of the other ones that we've had because we've just got the three elements, but we've got a few poll questions just to kind of get the conversation going um, a little bit as well. So I'm going to ask Saima to kind of share some polls now for you to kind of engage with and give us your responses to it, and then hopefully we'll just open up the conversation following some of those as well. Right, so do you currently gain data on the demographics of your customers or clients? First one. I 
we're waiting for some of the responses, Katie. I'm just going to say a little bit about. Um, I've been reflecting on this question since I've put the poll up. Um, and although we are here at the council, we do collect data um, on the demographics of our service users. I think our data isn't kind of holistic, apart from obviously the national government um, um, survey that we have. In terms of more locally, we do have different departments or teams collecting different types of data and they're for different purposes um, and to different audiences. Uh, but there isn't anything kind of holistic that goes out to um, the, the, the district in Bradford. And I'm wondering whether there might be something you just maybe triggered a thought around any such surveys that we need to send out in the council, maybe to combine them and kind of add questions that um, Again, I don't know how possible that will be, obviously, depending on um, how if you've got, I don't know, hundreds of departments working on different surveys, we potentially can't combine them unless they happen I don't know, every five years, um, like the ONS does. Um, but yeah, I'm just wondering whether there is any way we could reduce or kind of combine or even make accessible that data to one another. So there isn't a repetition because one mm. of the things I, I do, I'm learning recently, not just within the council, but externally, teams are trying to work to avoid repetition and yeah. service is one area. So Zara sent out a survey recently. We had to kind of say to teams that we sent it to be very mindful of other services you're sending around the same time because the response rates will be higher or, or lower if people have got kind of overwhelmed with, with too many surveys around the same time. So. I don't know if there's a strategy, especially for large organisations, which is the case for the council, um, to be able to manage all of that, but still and, and share some of that that stuff. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's yeah. any good practice that you might be aware of. Irfan's got a question as well. Yeah. Or, or are you doing it well, Irfan? Is there some best practice that you can share from the university? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, and it, it's an interesting question because a lot of the services that we use, obviously our clients are our customers and our clients are our students, or our customers are our students, but we also have outsourced services that um, I'm, I don't know if we collect data on. So for instance, um, our catering is all, all, catering is all outsourced. Um, so we, I'm not sure if we collect data on, on, on those, but uh, and but we're a small organization well, in comparison to the council we're a small organization who will have lots of outsourced services so i'm not sure if it's possible to collect demographic data on all their staff members or, or their mm -hmm. customers do you know what i mean it's quite a difficult one mm. and it did and, and I think it's an interesting one because I think you can get survey fatigue, can't you really? And I think it's um, it's it's how do you join up to kind of understand, you know, if you're because you want to kind of find out so many different things from customers and it might be what their preferences might be. But actually, then it might be just to understand actually how diverse are they? And obviously some of that was we know even asking our own you know workforce that it's quite um, they're quite personal and quite emotive when someone asks you for your diversity characteristics. And so actually that can be quite challenging to kind of get you know, um, a really good response rate and understanding about what that looks like. Um, and so it's there might be certain demographics that we've got an idea of. And, and I guess maybe some people feel more comfortable when it's a customer related one to, to kind of provide that because they understand and they can see the market research potentially, which might be helping them, you know, um, in terms of kind of what the products might, you know, might be more kind of inclusive for them. Um, but in terms of kind of those, so you've all sort of said, you know, actually, yes, you do get that data, but do do any of you know what happens to that data? And is there something, is there quite a structured way that that data is then used um, to be able to kind of improve products or services going forwards? I think in the council, it's um, like I said, the, the data, the so demographic data is usually collected alongside other questionnaires and surveys. There isn't a specific survey that goes out to find out kind of about the demographics of our service users, but on the back of other surveys that we might have, we are kind of always add some demographic data. Um, but again, like I said, the audiences are very diverse um, and we don't, the teams that send that, that out, I don't know what they do with the demographic data. Obviously the rest of the data they use to kind of address whichever 
issue or kind of project that they're aiming at, but I don't know whether there's anything that's, that actually happens practically with the demographic data at all. I don't know, I couldn't say. I mean, I can say for the team that I work in, so um, obviously we collect demographic data for every service that we commission. Um, and we look at that, we have contract officers who look at that quarterly and they look at that bit compared to, um, you know, Bradford District and our demographics and then follow up in contract meetings with providers if we think there's gaps and plan with them how we would, um, you know, target that particular group of people to see whether it was a um a service that they wanted or needed and obviously when we recommission we would do a piece of needs analysis that's looking to see what the need is and then the demographics in the monitoring data you're matching up to see whether you you think you're meeting the need so so it is quite systematic and regular and just part and parcel of what we we do really because it because it's commission services and, and that makes sense, doesn't it, really? Because it's so, you know, obviously, if you've got a service to provide, you've got to demonstrate that you are kind of, you know, actually continuously making sure that you're you're reaching the right audiences in that way, which makes sense. And I think particularly, I think from a customer perspective, I can imagine, um, you know, and certainly with clients that we work with, that maybe there is, you know, a product that is selling or a service, you know, if it's a private organisation as well. Clearly, you want to sell as much as you can, provide as much of a service, whether that means you'll be more profitable, for example. And so actually, there does seem to be much more of a structured way of kind of engaging that to be able to kind of find those gaps, plug those gaps with the right service or product going forward. So it always seems to be quite well, you know, a well oiled machine when it comes to kind of like customer service, um, you know, uh, product development, that kind of thing. Um, and it's interesting because we don't see sometimes that really structured way of doing that internally but actually you know our internal customers are our employees um, and so it's quite interesting when you look at the, the you know if we applied the same approach that we did with our customers to our employees in some way um, we would potentially find that we would get you know perhaps um, certainly in some organizations we would find that we would get a better response in terms of kind of increasing diversity for example julie um, well, we just we did that recently. We um, we had a survey just well within within our team, which is um, gosh, I don't know how many people now, but probably about a hundred or so people. Um, and as well as asking people if they would be comfortable with just telling us how they define themselves against the characteristics, we also kind of asked some more general questions like, you know, you've, does this feel like an organisation that, you know, where you're respected or whether you, you could get on or sort of um, questions like like that. So we've kind of, we, we have fairly recently done that as a, a one off within the team. And did you get quite a good response rate? Um, it varied from the within the team. So within the min, sort of sub teams overall, people, um, commissioners, contractors, uh, contracting staff, we, we got a really good response. People whose role is um, more more akin to admin, the response rate wasn't as good. And it's interesting, isn't it? And I think that's the the key thing around when you're asking people for this sort of data is it can be um, you don't always get 100 percent response rate, which would be the ideal. And we know that it's not always going to be. Um, but it's always interesting about how um, if you see certain groups haven't responded as well, it's that's quite interesting in its own right. So, OK, well, clearly there's a bit more engagement work to be done with that particular group to understand why they might be reticent to respond to that, because ultimately the intention is that with that data and would create an action plan to make people feel more inclusive and, and you know, increase diversity. Um, and we've talked in previous sessions around that communication is, is really, really key and the same. And we'll talk about some of this as well as I do sort of the summing up bit. But. Um, you know, communicating intentions and being really clear about, you know, actually, how do you then, if you capture data, how do you share what your intentions will be? How do you then share what your action will be following, you know, receiving that and then following up continuously? Because again, sometimes that follow through um, isn't often where, you know, organisations will let themselves down by just going silent and then not saying, well, actually, you know, we asked you for this, you gave us this, this is what we said we would do, this is what we've done, this is now the consequence of it. And if you don't follow through and kind of circle back, 
people start to lose trust and that's where we start to see again a, a shift in terms of that engagement and response rate to things so um that's really helpful thank you julie um i think we've got a couple more poll questions simon if you want mind popping the next one up One second, I'm just trying to figure out which one it was next. Is the organisation actively involved? I think it's this one. Oh, no, it's not. It will be a moment. I think we did that one earlier. Did we? Um, it's OK, I found it. I, I lost track. I, I was on a different screen. There we are. So this one's a bit more mixed, I think. Yeah, I'm toing and froing between yes and no at the moment, um, Katie. Um, when you say practices, do you mean? I guess it's just. I guess it's just. It actually, it's probably just a bit long-winded the way that I've put done the question there. But really, do you gain you know feedback from? whether it's service users, customers, clients, whatever that that might be around how include how inclusive they feel. So it's almost, I guess, going out to the community and actually have we got a view about how you are viewed as an employer um, or as a service or product provider in terms of how inclusive, you know, is that something that whether it's your customer experience teams or, um, you know, or sales teams or anything like that who might gain that kind of feedback or actually is that an area that perhaps we don't necessarily think to ask um, customers about? So we've got so we have got real kind of mix there in terms of yes and no. Um, so for those of you that have said yes, is there a, is that a specific sort of, I guess, question or whether it's kind of a, 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 um, a part of some sort of questions that you that you would ask? Um, Sonia, you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, I think it's a funny one. Like Simon, it was a bit of a tricky one, that one. Um, I don't, I put yes, but I'm wondering if I should have put no, because we don't have a system in place for staff. I don't know that we've been asked as museums and gallery staff um, about that, which would be an interesting one. We obviously do to our visitors all the time, like the pre-question, um, mm -hmm. the pre-poll. So we're always finding out what our visitors think and what audiences we might be missing. And then we'll generate projects and displays and different activities to gain missing, you know, like said 20 year old men, we might not get into an art gallery as much. So why not? So how can we do things that 20 year old men would come in with their mates? So it's interesting about um, staff. I don't think we've asked our own museum staff, which is an interesting one, actually. Volunteer wise, I manage all the apprentices and all the volunteers and the, the non-staff people in the, that sense. Um, and I don't think we've even asked them. It's the new programme, it's only two to three years old. So it'd be interesting to ask them how included they actually feel. We obviously have regular meetings with them in here verbally, um, and then we move on that, but nothing official like a system or a survey or a poll, which could mm -hmm. be an interesting one to do soon, really. Yes, definitely. And I think if you've not seen um, the toolkit that we did with the council, that might be a really good starting point to kind of look at it from a point of view of looking internally and asking people their sentiments around how included that sense of belonging, um, you know, how accessible things are. Um, that might be quite helpful because we've got a few sort of, you know, um, elements in there, things to think about, um, access to different kind of um, online resources, which might help if you're thinking about doing something, even if it's simple as a, a bit of a survey, an engagement survey that you might do. Um, so that might be a good starting point. 
and 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 anyone else if, if you've got you know if you are in the yeses and you have been getting that do you um in terms of the roles that you do do you get any of that information that tells you um you know how inclusive um they that you know customers client service users think you are as an employer or as an organization do you get that information or do you just know that it's out there somewhere Stephen. Hi, yeah, sorry, I've, I've been a really interesting debate. I've just been um, <clears throat> listening in the background. Um, so we probably have two uh, levels of this. We have a an EVS, an employer voice survey, which is sort of run every year, which does have an element of, um, uh, uh, of this in it. I'm not sure it goes far enough, but I think it's a lot of it is the point, and we've come across this more and more at the moment, is the point you mentioned about trust you know, mm -hmm. I have a note above my desk for for that that you don't you feel you don't want to charge ahead corporately and go and do something because you you feel like you need to do something because that's where we need to get to without having thinking about how it would be perceived and how you are building trust on the back of of what you're doing. So it's no point having a policy or something in a drawer somewhere that you can refer to or on SharePoint or whatever if if you're not actually sort of standing behind it and people don't see that you're standing behind it so I, th I think that's I think dilemma is is a bit strong but we're, we're certainly I would say in a, a sort of balancing act at the moment in terms of how we how we do that and, and some groups um, um, work better than others our disability group which is the one I chair I, that's probably more in relation to trust that we have to build as mm -hmm. opposed to some of the others uh, where there's there's more of a sort of um, uh, there's more collaboration and openness in some of the other groups than there is through through dis uh, through disability. Uh, and in terms of externally, uh, we do uh, we do always kind of explore our customer bases. We've got a lot of people within social housing that fall within some of these groups, and we do look at, at um, or with providers, our ISPs, our ser internet service providers, always look at what um, what sort of social tariffs can be. Can be developed and delivered for for those area uh, those areas or those individuals, but um, it's um, it's it is a, it is a bit of a minefield. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't like to say that we have all the answers, but we're we're certainly trying uh, to some degree. I would say. Brilliant. No, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and I think I think it, you know it's still every like with everything, whether you're doing something internally and gaining feedback or externally, it's, it's a movable feast. And I think you know it's just thinking about how in how um, how useful that information and that kind of sentiment that we're gathering both externally and internally is to different pe you know people in the organisation. And I think um, just because of conscious of time, we're just going to move on to you know just to kind of sum up a couple of areas which might sort of you know help to think about how you can um uh sort of support that external piece and i think thinking about this is the inclusive employers um piece the the importance about understanding how the external market kind of perceives you as an as an employer is very helpful for you in terms of telling your employer brand story um so actually understanding how you're viewed so whether you can get access to that information that's coming from your custom experience or sales team or whatever it might be or however you capture that if you do I think that will really help you think about, well, what do we need to be considering in terms of what we want to put out in the marketplace? Um, so a couple of things that I've kind of added onto, onto this on this slide here is in terms of having real clarity about your organisational values. So what is it that you stand for and being really clear that that is not only kind of communicated internally, but very much externally around anything that you do, particularly from an employer brand perspective. So if you're looking for prospective employers, employees, you want to make sure that, you know, the story that you're telling about your brand is actually what is seen internally as well, but be very conscious about what that looks like out externally as well and also the social responsibility bit you know when we think about when we're recruiting um certainly um younger um demographics into organizations what we hear a lot is around you know lots of questions around kind of understanding your culture your values what are you doing from a sort of um an ethical standpoint social responsibility what are you doing in the community um these are sort of things that are very 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 much important to particularly the younger generation but we're seeing that you know throughout now particularly um following the pandemic and various other things as well um and a couple of other things as well you know um we forget that we are always on display so if you think 
think about when we're using social media much more, we've got a lot of our staff members, um, our leaders are on social media. What are they modeling in terms of their leadership behaviors? You know, that and actually even doing that internally, that kind of gets out, you know, stories are told around, you know, the behaviors of our leaders and that filters through. So thinking about what that looks like. So that leading by example, both internally and externally in terms of how you, how leaders, you know, specifically go out there. So thinking about what support leaders might need when it comes to kind of their external image um, as well. And then we've mentioned this in terms of communication, you know, regular communication, clear communication about your intentions, um, you know, whether that's on your website, your your point of view, but really thinking about that and getting, you know, um, a diverse group of people to kind of sense check your tone of voice, the content that you're making to make sure that, again, that is very sensitive, it's appropriate before it's kind of gone out into the external marketplace as well. Um, so just a few things there, but I think we've talked about a few other bits that will be quite useful to consider as well when you're thinking about the external impact. And I'm conscious of time and people have probably got meetings to go to. Um, so what I would say is if you've got any sort of questions, um, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if you've got any questions as well. But if you uh, need to jump off, please do kind of send them through to Saima um, if you've got questions and we can kind of post those probably on the LinkedIn page um, that we've got and we can kind of answer them so everyone can see um, those as well. Um, but we will be sharing, as I say, the video, the slides as part of this. And I know it's a bit of a short, sharp, bite-sized session. That's the point of these ones around lunchtime. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, please do let us know. But we will share all of the recordings and um, the, the the kind of slides, as I say, after this. Um, and if you've got any interest, particularly on the internal piece, I know, Son, you mentioned it around just kind of thinking about how you might be able to gather that. If you want to connect with me, very happy to kind of have a conversation as well. Um, but we'll also make access you know the links to the toolkit that we've done uh, you know in collaboration with the uh, with the council as well um so um thank you so much for your time but yeah i'll stay on if anyone's got any questions but if you need to jump off then um thank you very much really good to see you all and have a good rest of the week